sad if you're a chick like you, Charlie says. For old crocs like us, things are going to get worse in any case. You believe that, Harry asks, genuinely surprised. He sees his life as just beginning, on clear ground at last, now that he has a margin of resources, and the stifled terror that always made him restless has dulled down. He wants less. Freedom, that he always thought was outward motion, turns out to be this inner dwindling. I believe it, sure, Charlie says. But what does this nice girl here believe? That the show's over? How can she? I believe, Melanie begins, Oh, I don't know. Bessie, help me. Harry didn't know she calls the old lady by her first name. Took him years of living with her to work up to feeling easy about that, and it wasn't really until after one day he had accidentally walked in on her in her bathroom, Janice hogging theirs. Say what's on your mind, the old woman advises the younger. Everybody else is. The luminous orbs of Melanie's eyes scout their faces in a sweep that ends in an upward roll such as you see in images of saints. I believe the things we're running out of we can learn to do without. I don't need electric carving knives and all that. I'm more upset about the snail darters and the whales than about iron ore and oil. She lingers on this last word, giving it two syllables, and stares at Harry. As if he's especially into oil. He decides what he resents about her is she seems always to be trying to hypnotize him. I mean, she goes on, as long as there are growing things, there's still a world with endless possibilities. The hum beneath her words hangs in the darkening space of the porch. Alien. Moonraker. One big weed patch, Harry says. Where the hell is Nelson, anyway? He is irked, he figures, because this girl is out of this world, and that makes his world feel small. He feels sexier even toward fat old Bessie. At least her voice has a lot of the county, a lot of his life in it. That time he blundered into the bathroom, he didn't see much. She shouted, sitting on the toilet with her skirt around her knees, and he heard her shout and hardly saw a thing, just a patch of flank as white as a butcher's marble counter. Bessie answers him dolefully. I believe he went out for a reason Janice would know. Janice comes to the doorway of the porch, looking snappy in her daisies and an orange apron. He went off around six with Billy Fosnot. They should have been back by now. Which card they take? They had to take the Corona. You were at the liquor store with the Maverick. Oh, great. What's Billy Fosnot doing around anyway? Why isn't he in the volunteer army? It feels like making a show for Charlie and Melanie of authority. There is authority, too, in the way Janice is holding a wooden stirring spoon. She says to the company in general, They say he's doing very well. He's in his first year of dental school up somewhere in New England. He wants to be a, what do they call it? Ophthalmologist, Rabbit says. Endodontist. My God, is all Harry can say. Ten years ago, the night his house had burned, Billy had called his mother a bitch. He had seen Billy often since, all the years Nelson was at Mount Judge High, but had never forgotten that, how Peggy had then slapped him, this little boy twelve or maybe thirteen, the marks of her fingers leaping up pink on the child's delicate cheek. Then he had called her a whore, Harry's jism warm inside her. Later that night, Nelson had vowed to kill his father. You fucking asshole! You've let her die! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! Harry had put up his hands to fight. The misery of life, it has carried him away from the faces on the porch. In the silence he hears from afar a neighbor woman's hammer knocking. How are Ollie and Peggy, he asks, his voice rough even after clearing it. Billy's parents have dropped from sight, as the Toyota business lifted him higher in the county. About the same, Janice says. Ollie's still at the music store. They say Peggy's gotten into causes. She turns back to her stirring. Charlie tells Melanie, You should book yourself on a flight to Florida when you get fed up around here. What's with you in Florida? Harry asks him loudly. She says she comes from California and you keep pushing Florida at her. There's no connection. 
Charlie pulls at his spiked pink punch and looks like a pathetic old guy, the skin pegged ever tighter to the planes of his skull. We can make a connection. Melanie calls toward the kitchen. Janice, can I be of any help? No, dear, thanks. It's all but done. Is everybody starving? Does anybody else want their drink freshened? Why not, Harry asks, feeling reckless. This bunch isn't going to be fun. He'll have to make his fun inside. How about you, Charlie? Forget it, champ. One's my limit. The doctors tell me even that should be a no-no in my condition. Of Melanie, he asks, How's your Kool-Aid holding up? Don't call it Kool-Aid. That's rude, Harry says, pretending to joust. I admire anybody of this generation who isn't polluting their system with pills and booze. Ever since Nelson got back, the six-packs come and go in the fridge like... like coal down a chute. He feels he has said this before recently. I'll get you some more, Melanie sings, and takes Charlie's glass and Harry's too. She has no name for him, he notices. Nelson's father, over the hill, out of this world. Make mine weak, he tells her, a G&T. Ma Springer has been sitting there with thoughts of her own. She says to Stavros, Nelson has been asking me all these questions about how the lot works, how much sales help there is, and how the salesmen are paid and so on. Charlie shifts his weight in his chair. This gas crunch has got to affect car sales. People won't buy cows they can't feed, even if so far Toyotas come along smelling pretty good. Harry intervenes. Bessie, there's no way we can make room for Nelson on sales without hurting Jake and Rudy. They're married men trying to feed babies on their commissions. If you want, I could talk to Manny and see if he can use another kid on cleanup. He doesn't want to work on cleanup, Janice calls sharply from the kitchen. Ma Springer confirms. Yes, he told me he'd like to see what he could do with sales. You know he always admired Fred so, idolized him, you might say. Oh, come on, Harry says. He never gave a damn about either of his grandfathers once he hit about tenth grade. Once he got onto girls and rock, he thought everybody over twenty was a sap. All he wanted was to get the hell out of Brewer, and I said, okay, here's the ticket, go to it. So what's he pussyfooting around whispering to his mother and grandmother now for? Melanie brings in the two men's drinks. Waitressly erect, she holds a triangulated paper napkin around the dewy base of each. Rabbit sips his and finds it strong when he asks for it weak. A love message of sorts? Ma Springer puts one hand on each of her thighs and points her elbows out, elbows all in folds like little pug-dog faces. Now, Harry, I know what you're going to say. You own half the company. Good for you, Bessie. I'm glad. If it had been me instead of Fred, I'd have left it all to you. He quickly turns to Melanie and says, What they really should do with this gas crisis is bring back the trolley cars. You're too young to remember. They ran on tracks, but the power came from electric wires overhead. Very clean. They went everywhere when I was a kid. Oh, I know, they still have them in San Francisco. Harry, what I wanted to say... But you're not running it, he continues to his mother-in-law, and never have, and as long as I am, Nelson, if he wants to start there, can hose down cars for Manny. I don't want him in the sales room. He has none of the right attitudes. He can't even straighten up and smile. I thought those were cable cars, Charlie says to Melanie. Oh, they just have those on a few hills. Everybody keeps saying how dangerous they are, the cables snap. But the tourists expect them. Harry, dinner, Janice says. She is stern. We won't wait for Nelson any more. It's after eight. Sorry if I sound hard, he says to the group as they rise to go eat. But look, even now the kid's too rude to come home in time for dinner. Your own son, Janice says. Melanie, what do you think? What's his plan? Isn't he heading back to finish college? Her smile remains fixed, but seems flaky, painted on. Nelson may feel, she says carefully, that he spent enough time at college. But where's his degree? He hears his own voice in his head, a shrill, sounding trapped. Where's his degree, Harry repeats, hearing no answer. Janice has lit candles on the dining table, though the July day is still so light they look wan. She had wanted this to be nice for Charlie. Dear old Jan. 
As Harry walks to the table behind her, he rests his eyes on what he rarely sees, the pale bared nape of her neck. In the shuffle, as they take places, he brushes Melanie's arm, bare also, and darts a look down the ripe slopes loosely concealed by the gypsy blouse. Firm. He mutters to her, Sorry, didn't mean to put you on the spot just now. I just can't figure out what Nelson's game is. Oh, you didn't, she answers crooningly. Ringlets fall and tremble, her cheeks flame within. As Ma Springer plods to her place at the head of the table, the girl peeks up at Harry with a glint he reads as sly and adds, I think one factor you know is Nelson's becoming more security-minded. He can't quite follow. Sounds like the kid is going to enter the Secret Service. Chairs scrape. They wait while a ghost of grace flies overhead. Then Janice dips her spoon into her soup, tomato, the color of Harry's corona. Where is it? Out in the night. They rarely sit in this room. Even with the five of them now, they eat around the kitchen table. And Harry is newly aware of, propped on the sideboard where the family silver is stored, tinted photos of Janice as a high school senior, with her hair brushed and rolled under in a page boy to her shoulders of Nelson as an infant, propped with his favorite teddy bear, that had one eye, on a stagey sunbathed window seat of this very house. And then Nelson as himself a high school senior, his hair almost as long as Janice's, but less brushed, looking greasy, and his grin for the cameraman lopsided, half defiant. In a gold frame broader than his daughter and grandson got, Fred Springer, misty-eyed and wrinkle-free, courtesy of the portrait studio's darkroom magic, stares in studied three-quarters view at whatever it is the dead see. Charlie asks the table, Did you see where Nixon gave a big party at San Clemente in honor of the moon landing anniversary? They should keep that guy around forever as an example of what sheer gall can do. He did some good things, Ma Springer says, in that voice of hers that shows hurt, tight and dried out somehow. Harry is sensitive to it after all these years. He tries to help her to apologize if he had been rough with her over who ran the company. He opened up China, he says. And what a can of worms that's turned out to be, Stavros says. At least all those years they were hating our guts, they didn't cost us a nickel. This party of his wasn't cheap, either. Everybody was there, Red Skelton, Buzz Aldrin. You know, I think it broke Fred's heart, Ma Springer pronounces. Watergate. He followed it right to the end, when he could hardly lift his head from the pillows, and he used to say to me, Bessie, there's never been a president who hasn't done worse. They just have it in for him because he isn't a glamour boy. If that had been Roosevelt or one of the Kennedys, he'd say, you would never have heard boo about Watergate. He believed it, too. Harry glances at the gold-framed photograph and imagines it nodded. I believe it, he says. Old man Springer never steered me wrong. Bessie glances at him to see if this is sarcasm. He keeps his face motionless as a photograph. Speaking of Kennedys, Charlie puts in, he really is talking too much, on that one Kool-Aid. The papers are sure giving Chappaquiddick another go-around. You wonder how much more can they say about a guy on his way to Neck who drives off a bridge instead. Bessie may have had a touch of sherry, too, for she is working herself up to tears. Fred, she says, would never settle on its being that simple. Look at the result, he said to me more than once. Look at the result and work backwards from that. Her very dark eyes challenged them to do so mysteriously. What was the result? This seems to be in her own voice. The result was a poor girl from up in the coal regions was killed. Oh, Mother, Janice says, Daddy just had it in for Democrats. I loved him dearly, but he was absolutely hipped on that. Charlie says, I don't know, Jan. The worst things I ever heard your father say about Roosevelt was that he tricked us into war and died with his mistress, and it turns out both are true. He looks in the candlelight after saying this like a card sharp who has snapped down an ace. 
And what they tell us now about how Jack Kennedy carried on in the White House with racketeers' malls and girls right off the street, Fred Springer in his wildest dreams would never have come up with. Another ace. He looks, Harry thinks, like old man Springer in a way. That hollow-templed, well-combed look. Even the little dabs of eyebrows sticking out like toy artillery. Harry says, I never understood what was so bad about Chappaquiddick. He tried to get her out. Water flames the tongues of God. A man is helpless. What was bad about it, Bessie says, was he put her in. What do you think about all this, Melanie, Harry asks, playing cozy to get Charlie's goat. Which party do you back? Oh, the parties, she exclaims in a trance. I think they're both evil. Evil, a word in the air. But on Chappaquiddick, a friend of mine spends every summer on the island, and she says she wonders why more people don't drive off that bridge. There are no guardrails or anything. This is lovely soup, she adds to Janice. That spinach soup the other day was terrific, Charlie tells Melanie. Maybe a little heavy on the nutmeg. Janice has been smoking a cigarette and listening for a car door to slam. Harry, could you help me clear? You might want to carve in the kitchen. The kitchen is suffused with the strong, repugnant smell of roasting lamb. Harry doesn't like to be reminded that these are living things with eyes and hearts that we eat. He likes salted nuts, hamburger, Chinese food, mince pie. You know I can't carve lamb, he says. Nobody can. You're just having it because you think it's what Greeks eat showing off for your old lover boy. She hands him the carving set with the bumpy bone handles. You've done it a hundred times. Just cut parallel slices perpendicular to the bone. Sounds easy. You do it if it's so fucking easy. He is thinking, stabbing someone probably harder than the movies make it look. Cutting underdone meat, there's plenty of resistance, rubbery and tough. He'd rather hit her on the head with a rock if it came to that, or that green glass egg Ma has as a knick-knack in the living room. Listen, Janice hisses. A car door has slammed on the street. Footsteps pound on a porch, their porch, and the reluctant front door pops open with a bang. A chorus of voices around the table greet Nelson. But he keeps coming, searching for his parents, and finds them in the kitchen. Nelson, Janice says, we were getting worried. The boy is panting, not with exertion, but the shallow, lunged pant of fear. He looks small but muscular in his grape-colored, tie-dyed T-shirt, a burglar dressed to shinny in a window, but caught here in the bright kitchen light. He avoids looking Harry in the eye. Dad, there's been a bit of a mishap. The car, I knew it. Yeah, the Toyota got a scrape. My Corona, what do you mean, a scrape? Nobody was hurt, don't get carried away. Any other car involved? No, so don't worry, nobody's going to sue. The assurance is contemptuous. Don't get smart with me. Okay, okay, Jesus. You drove it home? The boy nods. Harry hands the knife back to Janice and leaves the kitchen to address the candlelit group left at the table. Ma at the head, Melanie bright-eyed next to her, Charlie on Melanie's other side. His square cufflink reflecting a bit of flame. Keep calm, everybody, just a mishap, Nelson says. Charlie, you want to come carve some lamb for me? I got to look at this. He wants to put his hands on the boy, whether to give him a push or comfort, his instinct is obscure. The actual touch might prove which. But Nelson stays just ahead of his father's fingertips, dodging into the summer night. The street lights have come on, and the Corona's tomato color looks evil by the poisonous sodium glow. A hollow shade of black, its metallic luster leached away. Nelson, in his haste, has parked it illegally, the driver's side, along the curb. Harry says, This side looks fine. It's the other side, Dad. Nelson explains. See, Billy and I were coming back from Allenville, where his girlfriend lives by this windy back road, and because I knew I was getting late for supper, I may have been going a little fast. I don't know. You can't go too fast on those back roads anyway. They wind too much. 
and this woodchuck, or whatever it was, comes out in front of me, and in trying to avoid it, I get off the road a little, and the back end slides into this telephone pole. It happened so fast I couldn't believe it. Rabbit has moved to the other side, and by lurid light views the damage. The scrape had begun in the middle of the rear door and deepened over the little gas cap door. By the time the pole reached the tail signal and the small rectangular side light, it had no trouble ripping them right out, the translucent plastic torn and shed like Christmas wrapping, and inches of pretty color-coded wiring exposed. The urethane bumper, so black and matte and trim, that gave Harry a small sensuous sensation whenever he touched the car home against the concrete parking space divider at the place on the lot stenciled Angstrom, was pulled out from the frame. The dent even carried up into the lift-back door, which would never seat exactly right again. Nelson is chattering. Billy knows this kid who works in a body shop over near the bridge to West Brewer, and he says you should get some real expensive rip-off place to do the estimate, and then when you get the check from the insurance company, give it to him and he can do it for less. That way there'll be a profit everybody can split. A profit, Harry repeats numbly. Nails or rivets in the pole have left parallel longitudinal gashes the length of the impact depression. The chrome and rubber stripping has been wrenched loose at an angle, and behind the wheel socket on this side, hooded with a slightly protruding flare like an eyebrow, one of the many snug Japanese details he has cherished, a segment of side strip has vanished entirely, leaving a chorus of tiny holes. Even the many-ribbed hubcap is dented and besmirched. He feels his own side has taken a wound. He feels he is witnessing in evil light a crime in which he has collaborated. Oh, come on, Dad, Nelson is saying. Don't make such a big deal of it. It'll cost the insurance company, not you, to get it fixed. And anyway, you can get a new one for almost nothing. Don't they give you a terrific discount? Terrific, Rabbit says. You just went out and smashed it up. My Corona. I didn't mean to. It was an accident. Shit! What do you want me to do, piss blood? Get down on my knees and cry? Don't bother. Dad, it's just a thing. You're looking like you lost your best friend. A breeze too high to touch them ruffles the treetops and makes the street light shudder on the deformed metal. Harry sighs. Well, how'd the woodchuck do? Chapter 2 Once that first weekend of riots and rumors is over, the summer isn't so bad. The gas lines never get so long again. Stavros says the oil companies have the price hike they wanted for now, and the government has told them to cool it or face an excess profits tax. Melanie says the world will turn to the bicycle, as Red China has already done. She has bought herself a 12-speed Fuji with her waitress's wages, and on fair days pedals around the mountain and down, her chestnut curls flying, through City View Park into Brewer. Toward the end of July comes a week of record heat. The papers are full of thermal statistics and fuzzy photographs of the time at the turn of the century when the trolley tracks warped in Wiser Square. It was so hot. Such heat presses out from within, against our clothes. We want to break out, to find another self beside the sea or in the mountains. Not until August will Harry and Janice go to the Poconos, where the Springers have a cottage they rent to other people for July. All over Brewer, air conditioners drip onto patios and into alleyways. On an afternoon of such hot weather, with his corona still having body work done, Harry borrows a Caprice trade-in from the lot and drives southwest toward Galilee. On curving roads he passes houses of sandstone, fields of corn, a cement factory, a billboard pointing to a natural cave. Didn't natural caves go out of style a while ago? And another billboard with a great cutout of a bearded Amishman advertising authentic Dutch smorgasbord. Galilee is what they call a string town, a hilly row of houses with a feed store at one end and a tractor agency at the other. In the middle stands an old wooden inn with a deep porch all along the second story 
and a renovated restaurant on the first, with a window full of credit card stickers to catch the busloads of tourists that come up from Baltimore, blacks most of them. God knows what they hope to see out here in the sticks. A knot of young locals is hanging around in front of the Rexalls. You never used to see that in farm country. They'd be too busy with the chores. There is an old stone trough, a black lacquered row of hitching posts, a glossy new bank, a traffic island with a monument Harry cannot make out the meaning of, and a small brick post office with its bright silver letters, Galilee, up a side street, that in a block dead ends at the edge of a field. The woman in the post office tells Harry where the Nunemacher farm is along RD2. By the landmarks she gives him, a vegetable stand, a pond rimmed with willows, a double silo close to the road, he feels his way through the tummocks and swales of red earth crowded with shimmering green growth, merciless vegetation that allows not even the crusty eroded road embankments to rest barren, but makes them bear tufts and mats of vetch and honeysuckle vines, and fills the stagnant hot air with the haze of exhaled vapor. The caprice windows are wide open, and the brewer disco station fades and returns in twists of static as the land and electrical wires obtrude. Nunemacher is a faded name on a battered tin mailbox. The house and barn are well back from the road, down a long dirt lane, brown stones buried in pink dust. Rabbit's heart rises in his chest. He cruises the road, surveying the neighboring mailboxes. But Ruth gave him, when he once met her by accident in downtown Brewer a dozen years ago, no clue to her new name, and the girl a month ago refused to write hers in his showroom ledger. All he has to go by, other than Nunemacher's being his daughter's neighbor, if she is his daughter, is Ruth's mentioning that her husband, besides being a farmer, ran a fleet of school buses. He was older than she and should be dead now, Harry figures. The school buses would be gone. The mailboxes along this length of road say Blankenbiller, Muth, and Byer. It is not easy to match the names with the places, as glimpsed in their hollows, amid their trees, at the end of their lanes of grass and dirt. He feels conspicuous, gliding along in a magenta caprice, though no other soul emerges from the wide landscape to observe him. The thick-walled houses hold their inhabitants in, in this hazy mid-afternoon too hot for work. Harry drives down a lane at random and stops and backs around in the beaten, rutted space between the buildings, while some pigs he passed in their pen set up a commotion of snorting, and a fat woman in an apron comes out of a door of the house. She is shorter than Ruth and younger than Ruth would be now, with black hair pulled tight beneath a Mennonite cap. He waves and keeps going. This was the Blankenbillers he sees by the mailbox as he pulls onto the road again. The other two places are nearer the road, and he thinks he might get closer on foot. He parks on a widened stretch of shoulder, packed earth scored by the herringbone of tractor tire treads. When he gets out of the car, the powerful Swedish stench of the Blankenbillers' pigsty greets him from a distance, and what had seemed to be silence settles into his ear as a steady dry hum of insects, an undercoat to the landscape. The flowering weeds of midsummer, daisies and Queen Anne's lace and chicory, thrive at the side of the road and tap his pants leg as he hops up onto the bank. In his beige summerweight salesman suit, he prowls behind a hedgerow of sumac and black gum, and wild cherry overgrown with poison ivy, shining leaves of it big as valentines, and its vines having climbed to the tips of strangled trees. The roughly shaped sandstones of a tumbled old wall lie within this hedgerow hardly one upon another. At a gap where wheeled vehicles have been driven through, he stands surveying the cluster of buildings below him, barn and house, asbestos-sided chicken house, and slat-sided corn crib, both disused, and a newish building of cement block with a roof of corrugated overlapped fiberglass. Some kind of garage, it looks like. 
On the house roof has been mounted a copper lightning rod, oxidized green, and an H-shaped television aerial, very tall to catch the signals out here. Airy means only to survey, to relate this layout to the Nunamaker spread across the next shaggy rise. But a soft clinking, arising from somewhere amid the buildings, and the ripples a little runnel makes, pouring itself into a small pond, perhaps once for ducks, and an innocent clutter of old tractor seats and axles, and a rusted iron trough in a neglected patch between the woodpile and the mowed yard, lure him downward like a species of music while he churns in his head the story he will tell if approached and challenged. This soft, disheveled farm feels like a woman's farm in need of help. An unreasonable expectancy brings his heart up to the pitch of the surrounding insect hum. Then he sees it, behind the barn, where the woods are encroaching upon what had once been a cleared space, sumac and cedar in the lead. The tilted yellow shell of a school bus. Its wheels and windows are gone, and the snub hood of its cab has been torn away to reveal a hollow space where an engine was cannibalized. But like a sunken galleon, it testifies to an empire, a fleet of buses whose proprietor has died, his widow left with an illegitimate daughter to raise. The land under rabbit seems to move, with the addition of yet another citizen to the subterrane of the dead. Harry stands in what once had been an orchard, where even now lopsided apple and pear trees send up sprays of new shoots from their gutted trunks. Though the sun burns, wetness at the root of the orchard grass has soaked his suede shoes. If he ventures a few steps farther, he will be in the open and liable to be spotted from the house windows. There are voices within the house he can hear now, though they have the dim, steady rumble that belongs to voices on radio or television. A few steps farther he could distinguish these voices. A few steps farther still, he will be on the lawn, beside a plaster bird bath balanced off-center on a pillar of blue-tinted fluting. And then he will be committed to stride up bravely, put his foot on the low cement porch, and knock. The front door, set deep in its socket of stone, needs its green paint refreshed. From the tattered composition shingles of its roof to the dreary roller shades that hang in its windows, the house exhales the dead breath of poverty. What would he say to Ruth if she answered his knock? Hi, you may not remember me. Jesus, I wish I didn't. No, wait, don't close it. Maybe I can help you. How the hell would you ever help me? Get out. Honest to God, Rabbit, just looking at you makes me sick. I have money now. I don't want it. I don't want anything that stinks of you. When I did need you, you ran. Okay, okay, but let's look at the present situation. There's this girl of ours. Girl, she's a woman. Isn't she lovely? I'm so proud. Me too. We should have had lots. Great genes. Don't be so fucking cute. I've been here for twenty years. Where have you been? It's true. He could have tried to look her up. He even knew she lived around Galilee. But he hadn't. He hadn't wanted to face her, the complicated and accusing reality of her. He wanted to hold her in his mind as just fucked and satisfied, lifting white and naked above him on an elbow. Before he drifted off to sleep, she got him a drink of water. He does not know if he loved her or not, but with her he had known love, had experienced that cloudy inflation of self which makes us infants again and tips each moment with a plain excited purpose, as these wands of grass about his knees are tipped with packets of their own fine seeds. A door down below slams, not on the sides of the house he can see, a voice sounds the high note we use in speaking to pets. Rabbit retreats behind an apple sapling too small to hide him. In his avidity to see, to draw closer to that mysterious branch of his past that has flourished without him, and where lost energy and lost meaning still flow, he has betrayed his big body, made it a target. He crowds so close to the little tree 
that his lips touched the bark of its crotch, bark smooth as glass, save where darker ridges of roughness at intervals ring its gray. The miracle of it, how things grow, always remembering to be themselves. His lips have flinched back from the unintended kiss. Living microscopic red things, mites, aphids, he can see them, will get inside him and multiply. Hey, a voice calls. A woman's voice, young on the air, frightened and light. Could Ruth's voice be so young after so many years? Rather than face who it is, he runs. Up through the heavy orchard grass, dodging among the old fruit trees, breaking through as if a sure layup awaits on the other side of the ragged hedgerow, onto the red tractor path, and back to the caprice, checking to see if he tore his suit as he trots along, feeling his age. He is panting. The back of his hand is scratched by raspberries or wild rose. His heart is pounding so wildly he cannot fit the ignition key into the lock. When it does click in, the motor grinds for a few revolutions before catching, overheated from waiting in the sun. A female voice calling, Hey, so lightly, hangs in his inner ear as the motor settles to its purr, and he listens for pursuing shouts and even the sound of a rifle. These farmers all have guns and think nothing of using them. The years he worked as a typesetter for the VAT, hardly a week went by without some rural murder all mixed in with sex and booze and incest. But the haze of the country around Galilee hangs silent above the sound of his engine. He wonders if his figure had been distinct enough to be recognized by Ruth, who hadn't seen him since he'd put on all this weight, or by the daughter who has seen him once a month ago. They report this to the police and use his name, it'll get back to Janice, and she'll raise hell to hear he's been snooping after this girl. Won't wash so good at Rotary, either. Back. He must get back. Afraid of getting lost the other way, he dares back around and head back the way he came, past the mailboxes. He decides the mailbox that goes with the farm he spied on down in its little tousled valley with the duck pond is the blue one saying, Buyer. Fresh sky blue, painted this summer, with a decal flower, a sort of decoration a young woman might apply. Buyer. Ruth Buyer. His daughter's first name, Jamie Nunemacher, never pronounced, but Rabbit can recall. He asks Nelson one night, Where's Melanie? I thought she was working days this week. She is. She's gone out with somebody. Really? You mean on a date? The fillies have been rained out tonight, and while Janice and her mother are upstairs watching a Walton's rerun, he and the kid find themselves in the living room. Harry leafing through the August consumer reports that has just come. Are hair dyes safe? Road tests... Six pickup trucks, an alternative to the $2,000 funeral. While the boy is looking into a copy of a book he has stolen from Fred Springer's old office at the lot, which has become Harry's. He doesn't look up. You could call it a date. She just said she was going out. But with somebody. Sure. That's okay with you, her going out with somebody? Sure. Dad, I'm trying to read. The same rain that has postponed the fills against the Pirates at Three Rivers Stadium has swept east across the Commonwealth and beats on the windows here at 89 Joseph Street into the low-spreading branches of the Copper Beach that is the pride of the grounds and at times thunderously upon the roof and spouting of the front porch roof. Let me see the book, Harry begs, and from within the Barca lounger holds out a long arm. Nelson irritably tosses over the volume, a squat green handbook on automobile dealership written by some crony of old man Springer's who had an agency in Paoli. Harry has looked into it once or twice. Mostly hot air, hot shot stuff geared to the greater volume you can expect in the Philly area. This tells you, he tells Nelson, more than you need to know. I'm trying to understand, Nelson says, about the financing. It's very simple. The bank owns the new cars, the dealer owns the used cars. The bank pays the mid-Atlantic Toyota when the car leaves Maryland. 
Also, there's something called holdback that the manufacturer keeps in case the dealer defaults on parts purchases, but that he rebates annually. And that, to be frank about it, has the effect of reducing the dealer's apparent profit in case he gets one of these wise-ass customers who takes a great interest in the numbers and figures he can jew you down. Toyota insists we sell everything at their list so there's not much room for finagling, and that saves you a lot of headaches, in my opinion. If they don't like the price, they can come back a month later and find it 300 bucks higher, the way the yen is going. Another wrinkle about financing, though, is when the customer takes out his loan where we send him. Brewer trust, generally. And though this magazine right here had an article just last month about how you ought to shop around for loans instead of going where the agency recommends, it's a hell of a hassle, actually, to buck the system, just to save maybe a half of a percent. The bank keeps back a percentage for our account, supposedly to cover the losses of selling repossessed vehicles. But in fact, it amounts to a kickback. Follow me? Why do you care? Just interested. You should have been interested when your granddad Springer was around to be talked to. He ate this crap up. By the time he had sold a car to a customer, the poor bozo thought he was robbing old Fred Blind, when the fact is the deal had angles to it like a spider web. When he wanted Toyota to give him the franchise, he claimed 60,000 feet of extra service space that was just a patch of weeds, and then got a contractor who owed him a favor to throw down a slab and put up an uninsulated shell. That shop is still impossible to heat in the winter. You should hear Manny bitch. Nelson asks, Did they used to ever chop the clock? Where'd you learn that phrase? From the book. Well... This isn't so bad, Harry thinks, talking to the kid sensibly while the rain drums down. He doesn't know why it makes him nervous to see the kid read. Like he's plotting something. They say you should encourage it, reading, but they never say why. You know chopping the clock is a felony. But maybe in the old days sometimes a mechanic, up in the dashboard anyway, kind of had his screwdriver slip on the odometer. People who buy a used car know it's a gamble anyway. A car might go 20,000 miles without trouble or pop a cylinder tomorrow. Who's to say? I've seen some amazing wear on cars that were running like new. Those VW bugs, you couldn't kill them. The body's so rotten with rust, the driver can see the road under his feet, but the engine's still ticking away. He tosses the chunky green book back. Nelson fumbles the catch. Harry asks him, How do you feel about your girlfriend's going out with somebody else? I've told you before, Dad, she's not my girlfriend, she's my friend. Can't you have a friend of the opposite sex? You can try it. How come she settled on moving back here with you, then? Nelson's patience is being tried, but Harry figures he might as well keep pushing. He's not learning anything playing the silent game. Nelson says, she needed to blow the scene in Colorado, and I was coming east and told her my grandmother's house had a lot of empty rooms. She's not been any trouble, has she? No, she's charmed old Bessie right out of her sneakers. What was the matter with the scene in Colorado that she needed to blow it? Oh, you know, the wrong guy was putting a move on her, and she wanted to get her head together. The rain restates its theme hard against the thin windows. Rabbit has always loved that feeling of being inside when it rains. Shingles in the attic, pieces of glass no thicker than cardboard keeping him dry. Things that touch and yet not. Delicately, Harry asks, You know the guy she's out with? Yes, Dad, and so do you. Billy Fosnot? Guess again. Think older. Think Greek. Oh, my God, you're kidding. That old crock... Nelson watches him with an alertness, a stillness of malice. He is not laughing, though the opportunity has been given. He explains. He called up the crep house and asked her, and she thought, why not? It gets pretty boring around here, you have to admit, just for a meal. She didn't promise to go to bed with him. The trouble with your generation, Dad, you can only think along certain lines. <laughs>